Dear guests, kindly make sure that your mobile phones are switched off or are set to silent mode. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of His Excellency, Professor Jamal Sanad Suwadi, Director General of the Emirates Center for Strategic Research, we would like to welcome you this evening to a lecture titled The Muslim Brotherhood in Europe, Origins and Development, to be delivered by Mr. Ian Johnson. Mr. Ian is a Pultozer prize-winning writer focusing on society, religion, and history. He lives in Beijing, which has been his home for more than 20 years. From 1988 to 1992, he attended graduate school in West Berlin, worked as a freelancer, covering the fall of the Berlin Wall and German unification for the Baltimore Sun, the St. Pittsburgh Times, the Toronto Star, and other newspapers. In 2001, he moved back to Berlin working until 2009 as the Wall Street Journal's Germany Peru chief and senior writer. He headed coverage of European macroeconomics and wrote about social issues such as Islamist terrorism. Mr. Johnson has published three books and contributed chapters to three others, his newest book, The Souls of China, The Return of Religion After Mao. And his, and his other books include Wild Grass 2004 and A Mosque in Munich 2010 on Islam, Islamism and the Cold War in Europe. And now I would like to welcome Mr. Ian to deliver his lecture. Mr. Ian, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So I wanted to, uh, yeah, thank you very much for having me come and give this talk. I wanted to uh, explain what my talk uh, First of all, what the main themes are, um, this is not a history, an entire history of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's a look at the Muslim Brotherhood's origins in Europe. Um, and the, you may wonder why I got interested in this topic. Um, I was uh, heading a group of journalists who were reporting on terrorism in Europe after the 9-11 attacks. And one center kept coming up over and over again, and this was the Islamic Center of Munich. Um, and in fact, uh, I was in this bookstore in London, and I saw this map of the world, which is a quite common map, shows the different countries based on the percentage of Muslims. And on the side are famous mosques around the world. But strangely, in the far corner there, second from the top, is this mosque, the Islamic Center of Munich, um, which perplexed me because I couldn't understand why this mosque would be listed among the famous mosques of the world. Um, until I began to delve more closely into the history of this mosque. And of course, you have to consider who published the, um, this map, was published by the Islamic, you see at the bottom, the Islamic Foundation, which is an Islamist uh, organization. And so from their perspective, this mosque in Munich was really important and sort of on a par with the great mosques in the world. So I began to uh, look into this more closely, and all religious organizations in uh, Germany are registered with the court. They have uh, files, public fi files, on who are on the board of directors, uh, the minutes of their meeting, et cetera, and these are publicly available. So I started to, I simply requested this from the court. Who, when did this mosque get started? I knew nothing about it initially. And Starting on that trail, I began to reconstruct the history of this mosque. Uh, this is the mosque, actually, then, today. Um, and to, I found that the history of the mosque goes back to events in World War II and in the Cold War. And from my perspective, through this uh, mosque, you can see three different efforts in the West by Western countries to try to make use of Islam for political purposes. And you can eventually see how this mosque became an important headquarters overseas for the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, 
And so that's why I began to think that the history of this mosque, through this small example, we can see how uh, Western countries, including West German intelligence, American intelligence, and then also the Muslim Brotherhood, try to instrumentalize or make use of Islam as a political tool in the Cold War. So I uh, wanted to just briefly say, you know, uh, I started with a small amount of paperwork in a German courts, but I ended up going into government archives, personal archives, and oral history. That, uh, I worked on this full time for three years and then spent another year writing uh, this, this history. Um, I won't go through everything, but just to give you an idea, I went to archives in Germany, uh, foreign office archives, um, archives in the United States, including uh, different universities, the CIA. I got some, some in information from the CIA, although most of the CIA said, no, you cannot have access to that because it is a still of national importance. So um, they didn't, but I was able to get some information. Actually, I found the most interesting source of CIA information was ex-CIA officers who, you know, when you leave your office, when you retire, you're supposed to leave all your papers in the filing cabinet and go home. But actually, many of them, because they were very excited and proud of the work, they took their files back home with them, and then they died, and their children didn't know what to do with all this paper, so they donated it to the university libraries. And so actually, there was a lot of information in university libraries on CIA efforts to work with the Muslim Brotherhood in the 1950s um, and 60s. Also, Switzerland, the Swiss Federal Archives, they have files on Syed Ramadan. Uh, I looked at that as well. The UK, the Foreign Office, the War Office, all had uh, quite useful information. And then personal archives, I won't go through all of this, but these are p basically people who handed over their personal papers to me, um, and I made a good use of that. And I had oral history interviews. Um, some of these people are now dead. Um, but I talked to uh, dozens of people. You'll see the third one from the top, maybe, you know, Mahdi Akef, the former head of the Muslim Brotherhood. So I, I, I did interviews with these, all these people. At the bottom, I did 46 interviews in seven countries um, to sort of reconstruct this history. Um, so I think to go back, the first question you may wonder is, why? would they build a mosque in Munich in the 1950s? At that point, there were no Turkish uh, guest workers coming to Germany. There were almost no Muslims in Munich, you, uh, at least indigenous local Muslims in Munich. The reason that there were uh, a group of people that wanted to build a mosque in Munich um, is because it started in World War II when this is uh, the German army invading the Soviet Union. In the first year of the war, there were three million prisoners of war. Uh, the Germans had, this is a, a map of Germany's advance into the Soviet Union. You can see invade, uh, all the way down into the Caucasus and so on. The, the Germans had a ministry, and this ministry was to uh, manage these occupied territories and these foreign peoples who are under their control. In this ministry, where this building still stands in Berlin today, was this person, Gerhard von Mende, who was a brilliant academic. He could speak seven or eight languages fluently, including Turkish and many dialects of Turkish. He believed that the uh, foreign people in the Soviet Union, the non-Russian people, could be used to fight the Soviet Union. And so he set up army units, which included uh, some Muslim army units that were uh, set up. About 200,000 people fought for the Germans. Um, after the war, as you know, Germany, of course, lost World War II. The Soviet Union is invading. That guy, von Mende, realizes that if these soldiers are taken prisoner by the Soviets, they will be killed. Uh, so he arranges for them to be sent to Bavaria, to Munich, because he thinks it'll be safer if they surrender to the Americans than if they surrender to 
the Soviets. This is why we end up with tens of thousands of Muslims living in Bavaria in the 1940s. Now, most of these people are sent home, sent back actually to the Soviet Union or to other countries, but several thousand are able to stay on. There is a Turkish student group that went down to Munich in 1946-1947 and gave these, many of these uh, Muslims were from modern day Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, uh, Crimea, uh, etc. gave them student IDs and said, you're no longer Uzbek, you're just, just say you're a Turkish student, take off your uniform. And so when the Red Cross interviewed these people, they just said we're Turkish students so they could stay on and they didn't have to go back to the Soviet Union. So at the end of the 1940s, there were still several thousand Muslims because of the war who stayed on in this area. Many of them were simply, at the beginning of the Cold War, were simply uh, called DPs, displaced persons. And they lived in quite unsafe circumstances like this. This is sort of old barracks and were widely seen as sort of just a problem. Like we don't know what to do with these people. They're living, they have no uh, use for us here. But they were stuck sort of in Munich at the time. In the Cold War, of course, begins around this time. Um, and one of the features of the Cold War, we often think of the Cold War as being so important in Europe, the Berlin Wall, East Germany, West Germany. But as you're probably well aware, the Cold War was essentially important in these newly independent countries around the world. This is where most of the real hot wars in the Cold War were fought. This is where the Soviet Union and the United States fought for interests for, to try to win over countries. So this is a list of countries that were formed between 1946 and 1975. Um, and as you can see, many of these countries were in the Muslim world. And the Americans and the Soviets began to see Islam as a potential tool to be used to try to win over these countries for either the West or for the East. Um, von Menda, the guy we saw before who came up with the idea of setting up the Muslim youth, he doesn't disappear after the war. He moves to West Berlin and he sets up his own little intelligence service, which is uh, financed by, first by the British, and I, I have all of his personal papers, so it's actually quite interesting. I have all of his correspondence back and forth with the British officers, how much money he's going to get paid, et cetera, et cetera. And then he sets up an office here in Dusseldorf uh, and gets paid by the German BND, uh, the domestic intelligence in Germany, the Verfassungsschutz, and a couple of other ministries. He also has an idea in the Cold War that he could make use of these Muslims to help Germany, West Germany, in its Cold War struggle also. So you have these various competing interests in West Germany to try to use the Muslims who are left in Bavaria for either for the American side, for the West German side, um, and then the Soviet Union has its own interests that it's uh, pursuing. I'll skip over that. Um, I have a picture here of Eisenhower leaving a church. Eisenhower was not a particularly religious man, but when he became president, like a lot of American presidents, he all of a sudden became religious. Um, and he began to uh, formulate a strategy for countering the Soviet Union. His strategy was to use religion. He said, this is an advantage the America, that America has. America has sort of religious freedom. The Soviet Union is atheistic. And so uh, the religion can be used as a tool in the, in the Cold War. Uh, they s set up uh, the CIA set up the, uh, let me just uh, get the exact name, the Psychological Strategy Board and they drew up a memo called The Religious Factor in 1953. And this is Eisenhower. The reason I picked this picture is Eisenhower, you can see him there, third from the left, 
And next to him is a, a pastor, Ellsworth, uh, Elson, Edward Elson. And he, in, I have, I went to the Eisenhower archives in Kansas, and he has quite a lot of correspondence with this guy, Elson. And he says that, I assure you, I never fail in any communication with Arab leaders, oral or written, to, to stress the importance of the spiritual factor in our relationships. And in fact, he thought that he would try to encourage the Arab world to engage in a holy war against the Soviet Union until one of his advisors said, if the Arabs engage in a holy war, it will be against Israel and not against uh, the Soviet Union. So he sort of dropped that idea. But this was sort of, these are the ideas going through his mind at the time. In 1957, they draw up a formal working group on how to make use of Islam in the Cold War. Um, and they come up with an outline plan of operations. And this is where I think we get to the Muslim Brotherhood. Their key uh, tactic is to shun, to avoid traditional Muslim groups in favor of quote-unquote reform groups like the Muslim Brotherhood because they feel that these groups are more um, active in the, in the area and they're more maybe able to make use of these groups. Um, of course, the problem in formulating this strategy is the Soviet Union had roughly 30 million Muslims living in its territory. Uh, it was modern-day Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, etc. Um, the Americans had basically very few Muslims uh, living in the, at that time in the United States in the 1950s. So they were looking around, who can we make use of for our uh, plan here against the Soviet Union? Um, they set up this group called AMCOM Lib, the American Committee for Liberation, uh, set up radio stations. The most important thing is the last point. It set up covert propaganda. So covert propaganda is Obviously, this is not open propaganda. Open propaganda is something like Voice of America, which is financed by the American government. Covert propaganda looks like it's not propaganda, but it really is propaganda. So uh, what do I mean by that? This is an American agent who used to work uh, yeah, in, in the 1950s who was sent on the pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, the reason is the Soviets were now sending pilgrims to Mecca. And this was a place where you could meet, obviously, other people from the Muslim world and spread the word that, hey, the Soviet Union isn't so bad. They have now reopened mosques and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the Americans thought, we need to counter this. So they sent a Tatar, Garab Sultan. Here he's dressed. Um, it's, a, it's a picture, but he, he did indeed go to, to Mecca and followed the Soviet group around uh, cursing them, yelling at them. Whenever they tried to hold a speech, he would say, but you've closed down mosques. He would even threw tomatoes at them when they were trying to speak, etc. Came back to Germany, to Munich, where he's based. And uh, they have a press conference with Western journalists, and they hear about this whole story. But he doesn't say, I'm going there for the American government. He says, no, I'm just a pious Muslim who happened to go there and uh, fight, the, uh, fight communism. So this was a very elaborate effort on the part of the United States. They were able to use some of these groups, some of these people like Sultan to go and do pro covert propaganda. But uh, there was a growing feeling that these people were inadequate. At the same time, this is the American effort, at the same time, the West Germans, I mentioned that guy von Menda, he has his ideas that he wants to make use of the Muslims in Munich as well. There we have von Menda again. He brings to Munich a, an imam who had served in World War II, the guy on the left, uh, Nuruddin Namangani, and he gets the West German government to pay his salary and to set up an ecclesiastical administration for Muslims in West Germany. So this is in the 1950s, right? Don't forget, there are very, very few Muslims in West Germany, but, and, and you can't imagine today the West German government would pay for such a thing, but in the, in the context of the Cold War, they actually did. So they brought an imam, he was originally Uzbek, but he had been living in the 1950s in Turkey, brought him into Munich, and his, ta his task was unite the Muslims who are in uh, Munich and have them you know, work for the West German government. 
And his, um, hang on a second, let me just, yeah, his main tactic for doing this was to build a mosque. So now we get to the mosque. The first plan is hatched to build a mosque to unite the Muslims in Munich. Uh, and it would be paid for by the West German government as part of this plan to uh, f counter the Americans. Um, okay, so the Americans, meanwhile, I'll just pass up here a second. Uh, this is there, the CIA agent working in Munich in the 1950s. His name is Robert Dreyer. Uh, I was able to get his personal papers also. Um, in fact, I, I found him. I found his family a year after he died, and I asked them, did he have any personal papers? And they said, oh, he had lots of personal papers. We threw most of it away. So I was like, oh, no, he threw all the personal papers. Oh, we still have several boxes of personal papers. So he must have had a lot of personal papers. I lost, I didn't get 80% of it, but I still got quite a bit, uh, including you know, his application to join the CIA. Very interesting stuff, and why he wanted to go back to Munich. He was a real convinced cold warrior. He wanted to not just contain communism, but push it back. It was called rollback. This was the strategy in the 1950s. So Dreyer goes to Munich, deciding they need a much more aggressive policy. And also, they don't want these old uh, traditional Muslims from Uzbekistan, etc., are not really adequate. He feels that they need some more modern, the reform wing, uh, so to speak. So he begins to think of he comes into contact with Syed Ramadan. Um, and Syed Ramadan probably doesn't need an introduction, maybe in this audience. He's the son-in-law of the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, Hassan al-Banna. He, um, he went into exile after the Brotherhood was banned in 1954, and he began to live in Switzerland, in Geneva. So uh, Ramadan is also in uh, Germany at that time, or he's in, in Switzerland, nearby Munich, just about an hour and a half drive by car. Um, the Americans identify him as an important person who would be allied to them. Uh, this is a picture that of, of Eisenhower, you see in the middle, and he has Muslim scholars from around the world talking to him, and on the far right, second from the right, is Ramadan. Um, just get this. It's kind of a nice... Um, just thought I'd read this to you. Uh, yes, he... Uh, he went to this conference, which was held in Princeton University, and afterwards, they got to see Eisenhower. Uh, he was the CIA officer who was charged with monitoring him, uh, wrote a report on Ramadan and said he was the most difficult person in the room. Uh, he, I did, he said, in his opinion, he was a fascist interested in grouping people around him for power and had no ideas other than the, the ideas of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, in any case, that doesn't prevent the United States from working closer and closer with Ramadan. Uh, this is another picture from the same conference. There he is on the second picture, on second from the right. Um, when he moves to uh, Germany, it, when he moves to Switzerland in 1954, he, uh, a, a couple of years later, he goes to Cologne and becomes a PhD student there under uh, a very famous uh, German law professor called Gerhard Kegel. And I found his, I interviewed Professor Kegel uh, shortly before he died. Um, and he also gave me his personal archives, including all kinds of postcards and letters that Ramadan had sent him from around the world when he was going and doing all of his organizing work. Uh, Kegel said that he came to him, just knocked on his door and said, I want to study with you and write my PhD thesis with you. You're the most famous German law professor and I want to do my work with you. Um, Kegel initially said, what do you want to write on? And he said, I want to write on the implementation of Sharia law. And Kegel said, well, that's normally not the kind of legal studies that I do. Normally I uh, study case studies and, and that sort of thing. But 
it seemed interesting to him, um, and so he accepted him as a PhD student. Um, and then uh, he said, uh, he gave him, yes, his, his grade was an A when he got his 1958 Ramadan hands in his thesis, which becomes this book, which you maybe have seen. Um, it's certainly everywhere in every bookstore in Europe, a Muslim bookstore in Europe, you can find this book. Um, I asked Kegel what he thought of the, uh, of the thesis, and I thought it was, it was interesting. Kegel said, I would describe him as intelligent, if also fanatical. Ramadan was trying to build a religious utopia. I don't have anything against utopias, but I didn't like the exclusionary nature of the venture. One form of a religion above all other forms. Um, surely this is a recipe for intolerance. Um, Kegel had been a young academic before World War II, and his uh, professor had been a famous Jewish legal scholar called Ernst Rabel, uh, who had to leave Germany in 1939 when the Nazis took power. Um, he said, uh, Rabel remained lifelong my greatest role model. He was a victim of fanaticism, and I couldn't forget such a thing. I know this kind of fanaticism and felt uncomfortable with it. Um, however, he still got the PhD. And uh, Kegel, uh, it's quite interesting, Kegel advised 750 PhD students in the course of his very long career. And he said, this is the best selling of all of the theses. Because most of the theses, you know, they sell like five copies to libraries and nobody reads them. But this book became widely read. And uh, in, in, as I said, in many, many uh, bookstores, in mosque bookstores in, in Europe today, you can still find Ramadan's book. Um, so we have two things. We have several things happening here. We have the Americans deciding they need to use Islam in the Cold War. They identify the Muslim Brotherhood. They have had tried other things before, but they decide the Muslim Brotherhood is going to be more active, perhaps more, uh, more useful for them. You have at the same time the West Germans who are deciding they were going to build this mosque north of Munich, um, in the suburbs of, of Munich. And this all comes to a head in 1958, at this church, of all places, um, in Munich, uh, on December 22nd, the, uh, the man that the Germans had brought in to be the, the head of the mosque project, they meet here, of course, there's no mosque yet, so they meet in the church offices, which have been given to them to use, um, and Namangani uh, calls a meeting of a new committee called the Mosque Construction Committee. So this is now an official body. It registers with the courts, and that's where you begin to get this paperwork. So starting then in 1958, the Mosque Construction Committee is organized. Imam Namangani becomes head of it. Fine. They, four days later, they had then have another meeting, again in the church, on December 26, 1958, and Ramadan drives down, Syed Ramadan drives down from, uh, from Switzerland, and he says, you want to build a mosque? Here is 1,000 marks on the table, boom, in cash. And so everybody's really impressed. Wow, you know, 1,000 marks back then um, is something like, well, I, I calculated it as roughly five or $6,000 in today's money. So to offer that uh, sort of in cash at the table. You know, these are all uh, old, retired, impoverished sort of soldiers. And then you have a few young students um, who are 20 years old, et cetera, et cetera. So for them, this is like quite an impressive thing. Don't forget, Syed Ramadan is sort of like, for many of the young people, he's like a superstar. He's very well known um, around the Muslim world. And he's coming to help them build this mosque. So it's an incredibly uh, important event for them. And so the, you have this group of people in the church. There are, at that meeting, coincidentally or not coincidentally, many, many of the students, of the young Muslim students show up, the ones who invited Ramadan. Uh, and there are not that many soldiers. And they say, let's have a vote on now who should be head of the mosque project. The students, anybody can vote. There's no membership requirement. 
The students outnumber the soldiers. They all vote for Ramadan. And suddenly, in four days, Ramadan becomes head of the mosque project in Munich. And so uh, the mosque project then sort of becomes a Muslim Brotherhood project. Um, and I talked to several people. These, again, were quite young students, 20 years old, a 20-year-old medical student. I later, I interviewed him uh, later when he was a much older man. Uh, Faisal Yazdani, Pakistani, said, um, told me the room was full. It was an exciting feeling. We felt we were doing something idealistic. We were building a mosque. Everything, everyone was especially excited because of the presidents of Dr. Ramadan. He was a great personality, the head of the Muslim Congress. He was really famous. And here he was among us, helping us out. Um, but some of the other students began to have, uh, have doubts about this, about Ramadan's presence. One, uh, Ubaidullah Mogadedi, an Afghani medical student, uh, said the idea was to have a famous person head it. Per but he said, personally, I was against it. I was not against Syed Ramadan as a person, but Dr. Ramadan was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood and a leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, and was also a political figure, and not only a religious figure. I thought it wouldn't be good if the center was stamped as a Muslim Brotherhood center. We should work for Islam and not a group, whether it's good or bad. But Ramadan was a charismatic, captivating figure, and the students were uh, impressed, and they voted for, for Ramadan at this meeting in the church. So we have, Ramadan is now head of this mosque project, travels around the Muslim world uh, trying to raise money for the mosque uh, and also engaging in other uh, activities. Um, let's see. He was probably, I think, at the peak of his influence at this time. Uh, the Germans, of course, were very angry at this turn of events. Um, the German guy von Mende decided he would try to commit a, have his agents do a burglary of Ramadan's offices, break in, steal his papers, and find out who he was working for. Uh, the Germans were convinced that he was working for this guy, for the CIA. Uh, the Swiss intelligence reports, which are public record at that time, the case officer following Ramadan was sure he was working for the CIA. Uh, I don't think it's that simple to say he was working for the CIA, CIA uh, definitely or not. I, there's no conclusive proof in my view. But there's no doubt that he and the Americans were very closely allied in their efforts to combat uh, communism. I mean, they both had a common enemy in Nasser in, in Egypt. Um, so I think that was probably what, what drove them together. Um, he was of some... Use, uh, for example, um, Ramadan founded, um, the, he founded a, the World Muslim Congress. Um, at the same time, the Congress's meeting was sponsored by the Iraqi leader, Abdul Karim Qasim. Um, and this is a meeting, this is a, they had a meeting in, in Baghdad at, at the time. Uh, Ramadan intended to attend the meeting, um, but some agents had come to Switzerland to try to assassinate Ramadan. Police told him he probably shouldn't go. So instead, he arranged for our friend Garab Sultan, the person we saw before who went to Mecca. Uh, here he went and represented uh, the United States. So Ramadan was able to get him on very short notice uh, an invitation to the conference and he could then go and counter the Soviet influence. So you could see the two sides are working very closely together. Ramadan couldn't go, but he got one of the US uh, intelligence agents who could go on his side, in, in his place. Um, yeah, what happens later in the 1960s to me is quite interesting. Typical for, I think, Western governments when they begin to start something, they then lose interest. Because what happens in the 1960s is the Vietnam War. Uh, the Vietnam War becomes more and more and more important for America. It sort of loses interest 
in, this, in these other things, Dreher, the CIA agent, is actually sent to, um, he's sent to Vietnam to run covert operations there. I guess it maybe didn't work out that well, I'm not sure. Um, and von Mende, our German professor who ran the whole uh, thing in, in the Nazi period, he dies of a massive heart attack in 1963 at his desk. And the, that operation sort of winds down. So the West Germans lose contact with the mosque project. The Americans lose contact with it. And meanwhile, Ramadan is still head of the mosque project, going around and raising money. Um, and in fact, he spends, however, Ramadan spends more and more time in the six, as the 60s go on into the 70s, he spends more and more time at his center in Geneva and is kind of pushed aside out of the project. Um, eventually, the mosque is built. They raise enough money primarily from the Libyan government before the revolution. Uh, more than a million dollars is, um, is promised. And then after the revolution in, it takes place, Gaddafi decides to honor this promise. And so they come through with the money. They hire a Turkish architect who comes up with the plans for this attractive but yet quite small mosque um, outside of uh, Munich. These are the plans from the archives. And the mosque is created uh, and, and built. Uh, in, and it opens in 1973. Um, Ramadan, as I said, is sort of pushed out of the mosque project. Yazdani and others, he was the young Pakistani uh, medical student. He was raising, raised a lot of money. He was pushed out of the project. And instead, um, the, pro the project is primarily taken over, these are just some other pictures of it, uh, by this man, uh, Galib Himat, who is a Syrian uh, Muslim brother who re runs the, the project now for the next 29, who runs the mosque for the next 29 years. Um, you may say, well, it's just, uh, you know, what's so special about this mosque? There's some interesting aspects to it. The mosque is run, uh, Himat does not live in Munich anymore. He moves to Italy and runs the mosque out of Italy. Um, at the same time, Turkish guest workers are coming to West Germany and they make a formal application to join the mosque because they would like to worship at the mosque. And they are told they are uh, not allowed to run for office or hold any, any positions in the mosque. They're allowed to donate money, but they're not allowed to do anything. They formally apply uh, for membership, and this is all documented in the minutes of the mosque meeting, uh, but they're told they cannot uh, have any role in the mosque. So even though you actually now have a lot of Muslims showing up in uh, Munich, they're not allowed to use the mosque. So it sort of begs the question, then what is really the mosque being used for? Um, and again, it's being used by Himat and other members of the Muslim Brothers as, um, as kind of their European base. Um, and Himat lives at Campione d'Italia, an Italian enclave in Switzerland. Uh, he lives there with uh, next door to uh, Josef Nada, may also be a familiar name to some of you, ran the Bank Al Taqwa. Um, uh, Himat was quite, he's quite a reclusive person. This is an old photo of him. I had a telephone interview with him, but he wouldn't really uh, grant an interview. He's almost never seen in public, or at least this is the best photo I could get of him. But uh, Nada is quite a garrulous, outspoken person. Maybe he speaks too much, I'm not sure. Um, but um, he, uh, he was sort of the public face of the mosque project. Uh, so, the group eventually changes its name to the Islamic Community of Germany. It begins to spread. So it's just this one organization that's just charged with building a mosque in Munich. Then it becomes an organization in charge of mosques in southern Germany. And then it becomes in charge of mosques across and, and, and is, or it hopes to, wishes to become uh, in charge of religious life or Islamic religious life across Germany. So it changes its name to the Islamic Community of Germany. Um, people who worked there for a time included Madi Akef, who 
uh, you know, used to be the head of the Muslim Brotherhood. He lived there for several years when he was in exile. I interviewed him uh, in 2004. Um, the, the, uh, the mosque became a center, a focal point for Muslim Brotherhood organization in Europe. Um, they have a very important meeting with all the people from the mosque at Lake Lugano in 1977. They set up a series of institutions and organizations such as Triple IT, um, NADA, and Himat help the U.S. Brotherhood set up organizations in Indianapolis. Um, and I think the third point is quite crucial, and I think this is why the Brotherhood does so well in the West. They are organizationally very sophisticated. Uh, they set up interlocking boards. They're familiar with each other. They have a very complex hierarchical structure um, of, 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 of groups and organizations across Europe, not just in Germany, but in France, Britain, Italy, et cetera, et cetera. And it all basically started from this one mosque project. Um, so I think you can say that there's not an exaggeration to say that there's a network of about 50 or so people. Um, the, the leap uh, goes to the second point here. They set up this uh, Federation of Islamic Organizations in Europe, FIO, European Council for Fatwa and Research, the Europe Trust, which is a financing mechanism to build a mosque that would be um, sympathetic to the Brotherhood, and schools to train imams and activists. Um, let me just go quickly to my conclusions. I think the, an interesting point to me is how people continue to make the same mistake in, in that, first of all, I don't think, I think the, the fundamental problem that they had in the 1940s, the 1950s, and 60s, and then again today, is trying to make use of a religion to pursue these political purposes. Uh, we had this, the Germans tried this in the war, the Germans and the Americans tried this in the Cold War, and I think in some ways, even nowadays, with more scrutiny, the Brotherhood still gets kind of a pass because after 9-11, the benchmark for many people in the West was, is this group al-Qaeda or not? Is this group a terrorist or not? And if they're not directly engaged in terrorist activities, then they're considered to be acceptable dialogue partners. Uh, and these groups with the same personnel uh, are still dialoguing with Western governments and helping to set the tone of Muslim life in Europe. So I think the, my bottom line there in bold, the basic problem is not engaging with Islam, but trying to instrumentalize it, trying to make it into a tool for political purposes. Um, it's the book I wrote. If you have questions, feel free to send me an email, and of course, we'll open the floor now for for Q&A. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, for such an informative and interesting lecture. And now we open the floor. And I kindly ask whoever have questions or provide a comments to just stand up and introduce yourself and make your question concise so we'll have other audience to participate as well. Any questions, comments? شكرا على محاضرتك الرائعة والقيمة والمعلومات لأول مرة نعلمها عندي مداخلة حول موضوع أن تم, تج تم تجنيد الإخوان المسلمين من أجل محاربة المد الشيوعي أو الاتحاد السوفيتي لكن المحصلة النهائية وجدناها أن الأخوان المسلمين والحركات المتطرفة لم تقتل سوفييت ولم تقتل روس إنما قتلت مسلمين بحجة أنهم مرتدون بحجة أنهم كفرة فكانت المحصلة أنها لقتل المسلمين ففي بلد سوريا أو في العراق أو في اليمن أو في أي بلد آخر وجدنا آلاف المسلمين يقتلون من قبل الأخوان أو الحركات المتطرفة باسم أنهم شيوعيون هذا ما ردت قوله
Yes, thank you for the point. I think that's right. Um, they did not fight the Soviet Union. They were thinking of just short-term gain. I think this was the main goal, was to use them in these covert propaganda exercises. Um, but there was no consideration of the long-term consequences. Um, and I think on, on top of that is this effort to uh, this sometimes romanticize the Muslim Brotherhood. You can see this in some of the literature that's been published, uh, Mitchell's uh, history of the Muslim Brotherhood written in the early 1960s, I think. He was the American diplomat based in, in, in Cairo in the 1950s and interviewed people. You can see a certain, yeah, romanticism that because these, you know, they're guys are wearing suits, they look modern, they sound modern, that they must be modern. But in fact, uh, they're, they, there's a, an ignoring of actually what they do and say. So yeah, I, I agree with you. Another questions or comment? The gentleman in the back. Assalamu alaikum, it's me Yusuf Alawni. من الواضح إنه الإخوان المسلمين في العراق في العديد من الدول وفي إعلامهم عبر قناة الجزيرة التي يسيطر عليها الإخوان المسلمين يتحالفون مع إيران ما سر التحالف الإخوانجي الشيعي شكرا uh, That's a great question I, I, I don't know the answer to that I have to uh, I have to preface that I, because I do not speak or read Arabic, my research was done in Europe using uh, German, English, uh, French language sources. So I have no insight, I'm afraid, into uh, the alliance. But I think it does though show one thing. It shows the flexibility of the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood in some ways is like a, a chameleon, you know, the little animal that can change colors and uh, so depending on on how it sees it tactically it can change quite a lot so another question please شكراً محمد البشاري أولاً أنا بشكرك كثير على هذا هذا العرض وعلى هذا الكتاب له صوت كبير أو صيت كبير في عالمنا سواء العربي أو في المجتمعات في أوروبا عايز منك يعني استفسار كل الوثائق التي حصلت عليها من طرف جهات إما علاقات شخصية أو كلها جاية من سي اي هل عندكم وثائق في ليلة 11 سبتمبر وعندما اجتمع الشباب ال19 في مسجد ميونخ وكان لهم لقاء مع الامام محمد الفيزازي وبحضور بعض قيادات الاخوان في ايام القلائل اللي كانت قبل 11 سبتمبر هذا واحد سؤال ثاني ان سعيد حسن البنا كانت له اتصالات او تواصلات مع الاستخبارات الامريكيه وهذا باعترافه انه التقى بهم في زياراته في الحج و... وزيارات الحج هذه عاده عند الاخوان انها اصبحت لقاءاتهم التنظيميه في سنه 45 يرسل سعيد رمضان لانشاء التنظيم الدولي في ليبيا ويعيده مره ثانيه مع يوسف ندى بعد في سنة 54 أحداث المنشية هرب هرب سعيد رمضان مع عمر بهاء الدين الأميري مع يوسف ندى منهم اللي ذهب المغرب وطلعوا من المغرب على على سويسرا وثم القصة اللي حكيتها لقصة مجد ميونخ هذه الفترة تميزت بأن سعيد رمضان كان ذابط ذابط التواصل بين الإخوان والاستخبارات المركزية الأمريكية هذا سوف يفسر لاحقا كيف كان دور الإخوان فيما يسمى بالجهاد الأفغاني اللي حكيت أنت في قضية المحاربة البوشيفية الآن يوم 1 ديسمبر 1 ديسمبر قبل عشرة أيام جمد التجمع الإسلامي في الألمانيا الذي يدير المسجد ميونخ 
في المجلس, في المجلس الإسلامي المركزي الألماني لأن كل الأصوات تشير إلى إبراهيم زياد اللي أظهرت صورته بدون ذكر عليه إبراهيم زياد الذي يعتبر الآن دينامو الإخوان ويعتبر يوسف ندى الجديد علاقة إبراهيم زياد بالتنظيم الإسلامي والتركي إبراهيم زياد وابن أحد القيادات التاريخية للإخوان المسلمين زياد من أم ألمانية يتزوج بنت أخ أربكان وكان مسؤول عن الميليجولوش داخل ألمانيا وصارت حاله بين الميليجولوش وجماعة ميونخ مش بعيد على ميونخ يأتي عصام العطار زعيم الإخوان السوريين وينشئ في في آخر مجد آخر مجد بيال آخر فينظر إلى أن ألمانيا هذه بالفعل هل هي ألمانيا السلطات الألمانية أو الاستخبارات الألمانية بالتواصل والتوافق مع الاستخبارات الأمريكية تمكن الإخوان الانطلاق على مستوى أوروبا فأنا مطلوب منكم إذا تفضلتم هل عندكم وثائق عن كما وصلتم إلى هذه الوثائق الآن عن 11 سبتمبر واللقاء الذي حصل بين الشباب 19 داخل هذا ده المسجد اثنين علاقة الإخوان الآن مع الاستخبارات الأمريكية مع الأتراك مع كل هذا الشكشوكة الآن الموجودة في ألمانيا شكرا Right. <laughs> no, thank you. Great questions. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any secret documents proving um, that the mosque was re directly related to 9-11. I think the, the mosque in Munich was part of this. I guess the question that I was first interested in when I was investigating this was why were three of the four pilots in 9-11 why were they radicalized in Germany? They weren't radicalized in their home country, they were radicalized in Germany. So how did that happen? They went as students, they were not uh, particularly even religious when they went to Germany to study. Um, so this was kind of the inter an interesting question to me. And it was that milieu, that group of people that started in the mosque in Munich that were also in Hamburg and these other places you've mentioned that were all heavily influenced by, by the Brotherhood. I mean, German intelligence had those people on their radar screen after the first World Trade Center bombing in 1993. Um, they, um, they were bugging one of the business associates, Darkin Zanli, in, in Hamburg. Um, they knew that Darkin Zanli was going to the Al-Quds Mosque in Hamburg. They bugged the mosque, and then they sort of gave up too early, I think. I mean, they just sort of gave up sort of in 2000 or something like that. And then those students began to uh, radicalize shortly after that. So they were, those things were, people were aware of them. I don't think there's a direct you know, operational link, but I think it's part of that mentality that was fostered um, there. So, um, yeah, and you mentioned uh, El Zayat. Uh, he's also an incredibly charming, interesting uh, person. Um, I've met him uh, on several occasions. I, I put a picture up there of him, but that's the picture from about 10 years ago. He's a bit older now. Um, he is quite a funny person. He said to me, he took me out to lunch, and he said, oh, we think you must be working for the CIA. I said, oh, why am I working for the CIA? He said, oh, because you don't write very many articles, so you, somebody must be paying you money, so it must be the CIA. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's a, a very interesting person. But uh, yeah, he, he's a, a dynamo, as you said, p uh, pushing all of these groups. Um, more in the background now. He's no longer ahead of the... Uh, Islamic community, the IGD. He's stepped back, but he's still active in the Europe Trust and other groups like that. Question? I'm just interested if the Muslim Brotherhood were um, bo bothered you at all in terms of you exposing them. Did they try and stop you or did they get in touch with you? But it sounds like they were proud of it. Um, well, most of the book is historical. So I think that 
There, I haven't had any threats on my life up until now, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, uh, but uh, so I think it uh, hasn't been a direct problem for me. I think people like Zayat, um, was they are not happy with the book, but I was never sued by them. That would be, you know, in Germany you could sue somebody for a libel if you thought it was... But I have, actually, everything's documented. The book is written in a kind of narrative form, but at the end are 50 pages of endnotes. Every interview is documented. Every paper is documented. So I think it's not, um, it's hard to argue or, or yeah. So. Thank you. At the end of today's lecture, and on behalf of His Excellency Professor Jamal Saadin Suedi, we would like to once again thank Mr. Ian Johnson for his lecture, as well as the member of the audience for their participation. Thank you.